my name is Ivan Turkevich. I belong to the National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology. Uh, this institute is very big uh, with more than 2,000 researchers and a dozen of research bases uh, all over Japan. And uh, I joined AST in um, 2007 and my research was mainly related to photovoltaics and uh, photocatalytic water splitting, splitting in general to solar energy. So let's go back to the title of my talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, solar energy and uh, photocatalytic water splitting. Uh, however, I think uh, there are a lot of lectures uh, that um, um, give good uh, presentation about both of these topics and uh, they explain how particular solar energy harvesting technology works and uh, how photocatalytic water splitting works and uh, how to fabricate uh, better photocatalytic materials. And you can easily find such lectures online. And, uh, but in this talk, I'm going to make an attempt to show you what is the current status of solar energy technologies and why we should uh, not be too optimistic about it and uh, simultaneously why we should not be pessimistic. Uh, solar energy is going to play a big role in the future, but uh, probably not quite yet. So we better be realistic about it. And uh, I'm also going to talk about uh, why solar energy harvesting technologies uh, cannot succeed without developing compat uh, compatible energy storage technologies and why hydrogen generation by water splitting is one of the best options for the solar energy storage. So this part is going to be, um, is going to take approximately uh, two thirds of my talk. And uh, in the last part, uh, I will talk about uh, uh, photocatalytic water splitting specifically, and uh, I will briefly explain how uh, to make better photocatalytic materials. Uh, okay, let's um, take a look at uh, global, global energy production, uh, which is not only electrical energy, but uh, total energy. And we can see that uh, it is more than 95%. Uh, it's, um, it originates from fossil fuels, so like wood, coal, oil, and gas. And solar energy accounts uh, only 0.4%. And if we sum up all renewable energies like solar, wind, hydro, and others, such as biofuels, uh, hydrothermal, tide, and etc., it will account for 4.2%. Um, and if you add the also nuclear power, which is also considered as a relatively clean, then uh, we will get... Uh, uh, up to 6% only. So this is not uh, too much. Uh, and um, there is a lot of interest to in renewable energy but and a lot of hype about it. But uh, these numbers give you realistic understanding about uh, where we are now in terms of uh, clean energy. Uh, if we take a look uh, at um, electric power generation specifically. Then the share of uh, renewables looks more serious of up to 25%. Uh, but uh, mainly because of uh, hydro power, which accounts for almost 16%. The solar energy accounts for only 2.2% in total electricity generation. Uh, then you can see many predictions about uh, global energy transition to renewable energy. There are many different scenarios depending on uh, expert affiliation, so to speak, ranging from very optimistic, like 100% renewables, to conservative uh, of around 70% renewables uh, up um, uh, uh, at around uh, uh, 2050. But so you have to keep in mind that these predictions in both cases are still given by proponents of green, so-called green revolution. 
Uh, the question is how realistic these predictions, in particular the sonar, solar energy has to increase uh, an order of magnitude from 2.2% now to 25% in, in the coming 30 years. So the question is, is it possible? And uh, let's take a look at the progress of photovoltaics. Um, this chart shows progress of installed cumulative uh, photovoltaic uh, capacity of all solar power stations around the globe. And uh, it looks like uh, exponential growth. And uh, surely if it uh, continues in this manner, then uh, there is no doubt that it can hit the target of uh, six uh, terawatts, like an uh, uh, be like 25% in, in total uh, uh, energy generation. But uh, it is, uh, the question is, is it going to continue in such manner? And let's take a closer look at the case of Europe, uh, which is uh, shown here below in a green color. And it looks like it is already saturated. And we clearly see it in this detailed graph. There is still some growth, uh, mainly due to so-called rest of the U, like uh, these light blue bars here. But it is definitely not exponential anymore. Uh, and the question is, is it something wrong with the European Union or this is a universal phenomena and soon we are going to have a change of the growth trend worldwide? Um, this slide demonstrates the issue of intermittency of solar energy. Um, you have day and night, uh, good and bad weather, sunny and cloudy seasons. And here it is shown what happened in, in Germany in 2013. Uh, the PV penetration in Germany at that time accounted for only 4.5% in total uh, generation of electricity. But during some very sunny days, it satisfied almost 50% of the total electricity demand. So the boost of uh, electricity penetration for uh, ge generation from PV stations was so high that it caused uh, the stabilization of the grid. So this case was one of the first uh, occurrences of such a problem. And um, we know that European Union has uh, integrated grid and it is possible to manage such a situation to some extent by uh, redistribution of energy from one region to another. And by switching down uh, traditional power plants and etc. cetera. Uh, if you have uh, sunny weather, a lot of photovoltaic and a lot of photovoltaic power, uh, you have to shut down some uh, thermal power plants like gas turbine power plants. And then if the weather becomes bad, you start the, the turbines again. So the problem is that uh, this can happen several times per day and uh, which uh, incurs energy and economic losses uh, associated with uh, such a cycling of uh, gas turbine power plants. Um, there are many different models uh, that address the economy of integrating of a variable energy source in balance with the traditional energy sources. But the most comprehensive study has been published uh, by MIT report named uh, Future of uh, Solar Energy and uh, this report was published in 2015. And uh, this figure shows the cost of uh, progressive uh, curtailment of uh, PV energy generation versus uh, uh, PV uh, penetration level. In most simple words, this is the loss of PV generation that you have to accept in order to avoid uh, either excessive loss of money or avoid grid instability. So the conclusion is that it will be increasingly necessary to curtail or in other words, shut down uh, production from installed solar facilities in order to avoid costly cycling of thermal power plants. 
So this situation becomes relevant if you have a PV penetration of uh, around 8%. So this is uh, economic reasons. And you simply cannot install more than 18% uh, of, um, uh, solar power generation plants in your uh, energy mix. Uh, otherwise, it will completely destabilize the grid. And if you take a look at the um, PV penetration level in developed countries that uh, uh, were quite active in the introduction of renewable energy, uh, we can see that none of them crossed uh, this uh, barrier or 8%. So what, what a coincidence with the pre uh, prediction of this uh, MIT report, which was written almost four years ago. Um, now let's take a look at energy usage. Uh, globally, around 28% of energy is used in industry, 26 in uh, transportation, and 35 in residential sector. So industry likes uh, stable power supply. And uh, therefore, uh, we can expect that residential sectors and transportation can manage uh, to accommodate new types of energy, like uh, solar energy or new renewable energy. I think you had many chances to see these kinds of uh, conceptual images uh, of the so-called off-grid residential houses uh, that are 100% powered by solar energy and not connected to electrical grid at all. Uh, so here you have uh, rooftop solar panels connected to some energy storage systems uh, uh, in the basement. And uh, this energy is used to power all home appliances and even charge electric vehicle. Unfortunately, such concepts of off-grid houses are not uh, realistic, at least to my opinion. Uh, because you simply don't have enough space on the roof of a typical residential houses, uh, at least in Japan, uh, and uh, where you can install PV system that meets uh, the energy demand. And uh, there are some examples of off-grid buildings, and they look like this. So in particular, this is the, one of the buildings in uh, Griffith University in Australia, uh, in the Brisbane campus. I visited this building and uh, you can see the uh, roof, um, uh, PV roof is, uh, is very large and also uh, PV panels that are installed on the walls of the building. So, so to speak, uh, every inch of this building is covered by PV uh, panels. Um, they have um, some problems with the designs of energy storage system, which is a hydrogen uh, uh, storage. Uh, but uh, this is another story and I can explain it later at the end of my presentation. So the main... Uh, conclusion uh, that follows from this is uh, that it is not realistic to uh, think about isolated off-grid houses. So we have to develop integrated systems that serves large communities and integrate uh, rooftop, rooftop PV installation and uh, with uh, large solar power pl plants around the city and etc. As well as uh, we have to install community level energy storage systems. Um, now we understand the reason uh, why we should be realistic about our expectations regarding solar energy. And we also understand why high penetration of photovoltaics above 8% in the energy mix requires energy storage. And why there is a strong connection between uh, development of solar energy technologies and energy uh, storage technologies. Uh, now, um, I want to speak about uh, conversion of solar energy to hydrogen and uh, uh, what advantages it gives uh, versus solar to lithium-ion battery storage. 
and um, uh, we have many possibilities for the uh, electrical energy storage systems uh, like uh, battery storage, different kinds of batteries, uh, pumped hydro, compressed air, flywheels, uh, and uh, also, of course, uh, uh, hydrogen generation by water splitting. Uh, regarding lithium ion batteries, there was uh, um, a brilliant lecture of uh, Dr. Stevenson from Skoltech, uh, I think one week ago, uh, in, in this online le lecture series. And if you want to know uh, more about uh, um, uh, batteries, uh, electrochemical batteries, then uh, please take a look at this uh, uh, lecture. And um, uh, speaking uh, about uh, comparison between hydrogen storage and lithium ion storage, it is necessary to understand uh, this parameter, which is energy storage on investment. And uh, this is a ratio between um, energy, uh, which you can dispatch to grid over lifetime of particular uh, battery or storage system, and the energy which is required to manufacture this uh, uh, energy storage system. And uh, uh, for example, for the lithium ion batteries, uh, this parameter is 35. That means that uh, you use some energy to produce a lithium ion battery uh, and then uh, you, uh, you can charge the same amount uh, of energy to this battery only 35 times. After that, uh, you have to replace the battery. Uh, however, the, uh, this parameter does not account uh, 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 recycling of uh, lithium ion batteries. So it is very difficult to extract uh, lithium from old battery and produce a new battery. So if you account also for the energy uh, which is required for recycling, then this parameter decreased to five. And uh, in the case of hydrogen, uh, you don't have such a problem. And um, so this parameter uh, is around 70. So almost two times uh, better, better uh, uh, parameter. Um, this is explanation why um, United States uh, perhaps they, they uh, decided to uh, use uh, uh, lithium ion batteries in, in future transportation. And this is because um, the main reserve of lithium uh, is mainly located located in South America, in uh, there is so-called uh, uh, Bolivia, Argentina, Chile Triangle. And um, uh, so if we um, calculate how much lithium is possible to extract uh, from, from these reserves and how much, uh, how many um, cars, electric cars we can produce from this lithium, and what is the demand for the cars uh, in, in, for example, United States, then uh, United States can satisfy its needs for uh, lithium for the electrical vehicles for 30 or 50 years only. So this is not, um, maybe it's good for one country, but definitely uh, this solution cannot uh, satisfy all, all, all the world. And, um, uh, this is the um, uh, this graph shows the funding of uh, uh, the decrease of R and D budget on hydrogen storage and fuel cells, and increase of R and D budget on battery storage, and this signifies about like a decision to select uh, electrical vehicles uh, as a primary technology in the United States for for the next generation.
of vehicles. And um, if you compare these two types of cars, uh, one is fuel cell vehicle, and uh, which is uh, represented by uh, Toyota Mirai, and battery electric vehicle, which is represented by Tesla, uh, we can actually compare their efficiency. And uh, it looks like in the beginning that the um, electric vehicle is more efficient uh, if you just account uh, the electricity taken from the grid. But uh, if we account for how uh, this electricity is produced, uh, which is now mainly from hydrocarbons, then uh, even now the hydrogen cars, they, uh, they are better in so-called well-to-wheel uh, efficiency. Uh, and uh, also uh, another advantage of fuel cell uh, vehicles is uh, um, uh, the mass of um, uh, uh, of uh, the lithium ion battery is uh, rather high. So if you consider like uh, 600 kilometers, then uh, the mass of lithium ion battery for electric vehicles sh should be around 2000 kilograms. But uh, the uh, weight of the fuel cell system is uh, less than uh, 1500 kilograms. And uh, this is the, also the comparison of um, weight for the system uh, uh, between lithium ion battery and uh, hydrogen uh, um, system for the, for the car. And uh, if we take a look at the world energy used in transportation, then we will see that um, uh, the light road vehicles, so they account for around 50%. So we also have uh, um, heavy road vehicles uh, and uh, buses and so on. And uh, lithium ion batteries, they are not suitable to power such big vehicles. And uh, we can see uh, this comparison. So uh, electric vehicles, they are usually light vehicles like motor motorcycles and uh, of course, uh, personal cars. Uh, but um, uh, if we want to produce uh, trucks uh, and uh, buses, then there is no option then to go for a fuel cell vehicle. Uh, interesting, uh, there are also interesting examples that uh, batteries they are not suitable for aviation. And uh, in uh, Soviet Union, there was an experimental uh, airplane uh, Tupolev uh, 156, and it took first flight in 1988, and uh, it, the number of flights was over 100, and it was powered by a hydrogen. And it was developed in the um, um, Soviet Union uh, within so-called hydrogen fuel economy project. Uh, the main target was uh, convert nuclear energy to hydrogen. And it used a cryogenic uh, hydrogen storage tank. I think th this is a re remarkable achievement uh, uh, for that time. Uh, we also have other examples of uh, fuel cell ve vehicle uh, air, um, aircrafts uh, uh, from Boeing, uh, like small aircrafts. Uh, and uh, I think this is a European uh, project for the fuel cell powered uh, personal airplane. Uh, so to summarize uh, this part, um, uh, I want to answer the question why solar hydrogen has strategic advantages in transportation. So there are some disadvantages of uh, battery powered uh, electric vehicles. So heavy electric vehicles are not feasible because the weight of the battery uh, is going to be, become, become too heavy. Uh, intermittency of photovoltaic will require stationary storage batteries, uh, uh, which uh, increase uh, lithium usage uh, two or three times. That means that uh, uh, you cannot um, 
when you come to home uh, with your electric vehicle uh, and uh, there is a night, there is no PV generation, so you have to store that energy in your home, uh, which is collected during the daytime to power the vehicle. So you need basically two batteries, one in the vehicle, another in the home. And uh, seasonal storage is not possible. So batteries can only be used for short term storage for a few days. Uh, material constraints of lithium, they can satisfy basically only United States demand for electrical vehicles for 30, 50 years, and then there is no lithium. Uh, recycling of lithium is difficult, uh, so this technology is not really sustainable. And uh, long recharge time of the vehicle, so in comparison to uh, hydrogen, you can fuel the hydrogen uh, car in, in, a, in a few minutes, but you have to wait uh, around 30 minutes or one hour to uh, fully charge the uh, Tesla vehicle. And uh, also the um, battery just uh, lose the energy, uh, it dis discharge. Uh, so if you don't use your electric car, it will discharge with time. And uh, this is just a um, loss of, of, of your money. Um, there are some advantages of electric vehicles. So volt to wheel efficiency is 50 to 60%, which is like uh, better than in hydrogen car, but this does not account for uh, the current situation of uh, uh, electricity production, which still use hydrocarbon. But if we uh, reform the hydrocarbons to obtain hydrogen, then the um, hydrogen vehicle uh, has better energy efficiency. Um, uh, and uh, also one of the disadvantages of uh, fuel cell vehicles is it requires high initial investment to infrastructure. So there should be a so-called hydrogen economy at first and then you can uh, produce uh, your vehicles. But I will show later that the elements of this hydrogen economy already exist uh, in Japan. So um, advantages of fuel cell vehicles is that uh, surplus of uh, photovoltaic energy can be efficiently converted to hydrogen. So it's easy to maintain grid stability if you have overproduction of uh, uh, solar uh, electricity. Uh, seasonal storage is possible and uh, vehicles can be quickly refueled and the uh, Excess of hydrogen, if you have it, uh, it can be used in chemical industry to produce uh, ammonia and fertilizers. Uh, now I will talk about some elements of hydrogen economy in Japan. And uh, this is a general image, like a basic scheme of a hydrogen society. So it says that uh, we use renewable energy, then uh, we have uh, to and convert it to hydrogen. Um, then uh, we use it as an energy carrier and there are different technologies. We can liquefy hydrogen and uh, we also can convert it to MCH and ammonia. Uh, then we transport this hydrogen to the um, uh, point of use and uh, we can use it uh, to uh, generate electricity for buildings uh, and also uh, we can uh, extract associated heat to heat water. So this um, uh, conversion of hydrogen to electricity can be very efficient. And we can also use hydrogen for the transportation and not only for small vehicles, but also for big vehicles and uh, even for ships. And uh, mm, so this is like a basic image of hydrogen society. And uh, currently uh, the, the, the question is from where we are going to take this hydrogen. 
And uh, currently the main source of hydrogen, um, it is, uh, as it is viewed in, in Japan, is uh, uh, Japan is going to take hydrogen by using gasification of uh, brown color, coal, which is uh, in Australia. So Australia has a lot of brown color coal, which is not, uh, not used uh, because it has very low quality. And, uh, but if we reform it and uh, by using gasification so we can extract the hydrogen and then uh, the image is that uh, it will be, the hydrogen will be liquefied and shipped to Japan by, um, uh, uh, by ship, uh, so-called liquid hydrogen carrier. Uh, all of these projects, they are um, created by Japanese companies and they have agreement with Australia to create such operation. And uh, the image of uh, uh, liquid hydrogen ship uh, looked like this. Uh, this is a conceptual image, but in reality it looks like this. Uh, but uh, anyway, this is uh, this already um, the first liquefied hydrogen carrier launched in Japan. It uh, it's already operational. Uh, also, there are other projects in Japan to generate hydrogen from renewable uh, sources like photovoltaics, and uh, this is already uh, operational solar powered hydrogen production in Japan. So there is a 20 megawatt uh, solar generation uh, solar station, and uh, which is connected to 10 megawatt uh, electrolyzer, mainly electrolyzer, and uh, it produces hydrogen by electrolysis. And uh, it produces uh, approximately 1,200 normal cubic meters of hydrogen per hour. Um, uh, many projects to show uh, um, elements of hydrogen economy uh, was uh, developed uh, to uh, before Tokyo Olympics. Um, so Japan intended to show these elements uh, during the Tokyo Olympics, but now the uh, Olympics is uh, postponed. So um, this is an example of a conceptual image of a fuel cell bus, and this is a real one. And already uh, 100, uh, these more than 100 buses are produced, and uh, they uh, um, intended to be uh, used during the Tokyo Olympics. Also, this is famous uh, Toyota Mirai hydrogen fuel cell car. Uh, it was delivered to Switzerland and um, uh, this was like an image project to show elements of hydrogen economy in Japan. Uh, let's talk about numbers. So how many uh, of these cars are already operational in, in Japan? So it's uh, at present it's around more than uh, 2,500 uh, uh, cars or already pr produced and used in Japan. And uh, this is a number of um, uh, hydrogen uh, recharge stations uh, are built around Japan. Um, uh, and uh, I think it's, yeah, total 100 of such stations are already operational. And they look like this. So you have this hydrogen logo and you know that uh, you can power a hydrogen car on this power station. Uh, also, there are other projects uh, like to build uh, communities and uh, some parts of cities uh, that, that are entirely powered by hydrogen energy. At present, uh, there is a, it uses uh, natural gas to obtain hydrogen. Uh, but in the future, um, the hydrogen is planned to be produced from renewable energies. Um, now I am going to talk about photocatalytic water splitting. So, um, and um, so that's um, how we can get uh, hydrogen from uh, 
solar energy. And basically, there are three ways uh, how we can uh, do it. Uh, one is direct photocatalysis. So basically, you have uh, some uh, photocatalytic nanoparticles spread in the pool with water, and uh, they absorb uh, solar light and spontaneously decompose water to hydrogen and oxygen. Then uh, the second uh, system is uh, we can couple uh, uh, photovoltaic cells to the elect electrolysis. So this is so-called PV-assisted electrolysis. And the third one is uh, that we can couple uh, uh, photovoltaic cell and uh, photoelectrochemical cell, which is photoanode. Uh, and they are going to work in tandem to achieve water splitting. So the direct photocatalysis uh, from, um, from nanoparticles, uh, uh, at present the efficiency is very low. So realistic uh, solar to hydrogen conversion efficiency is only around one or two uh, percent. And, uh, but the, uh, this technology can potentially uh, be very cheap. Uh, so if you develop uh, efficient uh, photocatalytic nanoparticles. Uh, the PV assisted electrolysis is uh, at present the most efficient uh, technology. It's already mature. Uh, the realistic uh, solar to hydrogen conversion efficiency is around 15 to 16%. But it is expensive and uh, you have to couple two separate devices. And later I will explain that there are some problems that arise uh, from this uh, um, coupling. Uh, in the case of uh, uh, tandems of uh, photovoltaic and pho photoelectrochemical cells, they are also rather efficient uh, and they can achieve uh, realistic STH of around 10 to 12 percent and uh, they are potentially less expensive than the PV assisted electrolysis uh, due to possibility of monolithic integration. Um, I'm not going to um, talk much about the electrolysis uh, so but there are different uh, technologies for, for different ways uh, uh, how to organize uh, uh, just uh, electrolytic uh, decomposition of water. And um, so uh, with different um, current density ratings and cell voltage and so on. Um, what I want to explain now is that uh, about this uh, uh, coupling between a photovoltaic system and uh, electrolysis. And I'm going to explain it on this example of uh, um, off-grid uh, building in the Griffith University that I visited uh, several years ago. Uh, in this case, they built um, uh, big uh, photovoltaic system and uh, separate uh, electrolyzer and but they quickly found out that uh, um, it is not possible to directly couple uh, photovoltaic system with electrolyzer and they because of uh, intermittency of uh, uh, PV uh, photovoltaic output uh, so they had to install lithium ion battery in between, between the PV system and the elect uh, electrolyzer. Uh, and uh, the charge, discharge efficiency of lithium ion battery is uh, around 80%. And uh, if we also account for uh, uh, DC AC converters uh, all, all around the way, so uh, when you um, operate large uh, PV system, you cannot uh, uh, extract, uh, um, you cannot, it, it is better to transmit energy as AC voltage uh, to avoid uh, resistive losses. So typically you couple, you have a DC-AC converter on, uh, on the PV panel 
and uh, its efficiency in the best case is 97%. Uh, and then after you extract all this electricity, uh, AC electricity, you have to again convert this AC electricity to DC to charge the lithium ion battery. Uh, this is also 97% efficient. 80% uh, efficiency of lithium ion battery storage. Then again, you have to uh, take DC uh, voltage from lithium ion battery, convert it to AC, uh, transmit it uh, uh, to the electrolyzers, and before that again, convert AC to DC. So on every state, and the efficiency of electrolyzer is 80%. Uh, Therefore, at, at every st stage of this conversion and storage, you arrive with only 57% uh, uh, conversion of your um, PV output to hydrogen, which is very inefficient. So the more, more efficient system would be to couple directly electrolyzer, small electrolyzers uh, with uh, uh, photovoltaic panels and extract hydrogen uh, directly from photovoltaics uh, coupled to electrolyzer, which can give uh, around 80% efficiency. Uh, now about photocatalytic water splitting, uh, uh, the um, photocatalytic water splitting uh, was first demonstrated by Japanese uh, researchers uh, Akira Fujishima and Kenichi Honda. And this is their paper that they published in Nature in uh, 1972. So it's uh, almost 50 years ago. And uh, uh, this paper is uh, cited uh, uh, more than 18,000 uh, times uh, and it is in the top 100 of most cited papers of all times. Uh, what they did, they shined a UV light on a thin film of titanium dioxide, uh, which worked as a photonode, and they demonstrated, uh, and um, so this photonode was uh, coupled with a platinum uh, mesh, and they demonstrated uh, photocatalytic water splitting. So they had a generation of oxygen on uh, titanium dioxide and generation of hydrogen on uh, um, platinum. And, um, but there is no, for the 50 years, there is no much progress uh, for the inefficiency for the photocatalytic water splitting. So, what is the requirement for efficient photocatalysts? So the first requirement is stability against photocorrosion, uh, which uh, basically limits uh, the selection of materials to oxides. And um, not all uh, oxides uh, are suitable, so they also photocorrode. Uh, this uh, um, efficient photocatalyst should have a direct and optimal band gap, uh, which is uh, in the range of over 1.23 electron volts, which is just uh, energy required to split uh, water molecule. But uh, of course, we need some over potential uh, for to drive kinetics of water splitting reactions. So. Uh, the band gap should be a little bit higher, but uh, not too uh, um, wide, um, optimally less than 1.8 electron volts, because we want to harvest not only uh, um, UV light, but also visible uh, part of the solar spectrum to improve the efficiency of uh, solar um, uh, uh, energy conversion to, to hydrogen. Um, it also should have a right alignment of conduction band and balance band relative to hydrogen and oxygen redox, redox potentials. And uh, of course, it should have low recombination of photogenerated carriers. And it turns out that uh, simultaneous uh, fulfillment uh, of all these requirements is uh, very difficult in one material. 
So it's almost impossible to find one material which, which will satisfy all these requirements. Um, if we compare different uh, de dependence of um, uh, maximum um, conversion efficiency, so to hydrogen conversion efficiency, depending on the band gap of the material, and the band gap uh, uh, is um, gives us the amount of uh, solar energy that we, we can uh, harvest, absorb, uh, then uh, we can and we can calculate the photocurrent which we can extract theoretically possible photocurrent which we can extract from uh, uh, each material uh, then we can see that the uh, maximum possible efficiency of titanium dioxide cannot uh, exceed uh, 2.2 um, percent um, which is limited by, by its band gap. So the titanium dioxide, it absorbs only ultraviolet light. Uh, then, uh, for example, tungsten oxide, it has a smaller band gap, but the band gap is indirect. So we need a very thick layer of uh, tungsten oxide to absorb all the light. Uh, then, for example, uh, bismuth vanadate, uh, it has a direct band gap, so it's very um, good material for photocatalytic water splitting. Uh, it has a band gap of uh, 2.4 uh, electron volts, so it can harvest some part of the visible spectrum. Uh, and uh, it is considered one of the most promising materials for photocatalytic water splitting, at least now. So, um, uh, of course, uh, we, uh, th there is other uh, oxides with a smaller band gap, for example, like uh, iron oxide, but uh, in particular, iron oxide has indirect band gap, uh, and it is not very good for the um, harvesting of uh, solar light. So I'm now going to explain uh, my work, uh, which has been done in uh, collaboration with uh, Tokyo University uh, about uh, how we managed to achieve almost a theoretically uh, possible efficiency of this material. And um, uh, uh, bismuth vanadate, uh, it has a direct band gap. So we need uh, approximately 300 nanometers uh, thin film to absorb all uh, incoming uh, light, uh, solar light, uh, which, is, uh, which can be absorbed by, by uh, uh, this particular band gap of 2.4 electron volts. Uh, however, uh, this uh, bismuth vanadate material uh, it has very uh, low diffusion lengths. Uh, so the diffusion lengths of photogenerated carriers uh, is only 70 nanometers. So there is a lot of recombination within the thin film. And uh, this short uh, diffusion lens properties is very typical for oxide materials. Uh, which are considered for the with a low with a moderate band gap and which are attractive for photo uh, photocatalytic water splitting. So this is a general problem for these materials. And um, uh, in order to avoid this uh, recombination, we can decrease uh, the thickness of thin film. But if we uh, decrease the thickness, then we are going to uh, lose absorption. Uh, because when we decrease the thickness of thin film, then uh, the absorption decreases, and we just don't collect enough photons, uh, and uh, we just don't generate enough uh, uh, photocarriers. So the solution was to decouple these two processes, uh, so uh, create um, extremely thin absorber nanostructure. Um, 
in this nanostructure, we use uh, um, nanorods of tungsten oxide. Uh, the tungsten oxide uh, has a comparable band gap with bismuth vanadate, but uh, the, band, uh, the band gap of uh, tungsten oxide is indirect. And uh, so it does not absorb much uh, of uh, uh, solar light. But uh, tungsten oxide has much better conductivity and much lower recombination of uh, carriers. So um, we use bismuth vanadate, the outer layer, uh, thin layer, which is a thickness of less than 30 nanometers, to harvest uh, all the photons. Uh, create photogenerated carriers and then electrons, uh, because this is a um, type two heterojunction, they uh, enter into the tungsten oxide and they can be efficiently uh, delivered to the ITO layer. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, we can efficiently separate uh, electrons from holes and uh, holes uh, are, uh, participate in the water uh, decomposition and uh, they produce uh, oxygen and electrons they are delivered to the ITO and then to the platinum uh, counter electrode and uh, they uh, uh, produce uh, hydrogen from hydrogen ions. Uh, because we have uh, such a, a nanorod core shell structure and uh, the optical thickness of uh, bismuth uh, vanadate layer is uh, enough to absorb 100% uh, uh, of all photons uh, relative to the band gap of bismuth vanadate. Um, we fabricated uh, tungsten oxide nanorods uh, by using a so-called uh, glancing angle deposition. So when you have a normal type of uh, deposition, you keep uh, the substrate normal to the deposition source, which in our case was magnetron. But in a glancing angle deposition, you decrease the, you put your substrate almost parallel to the source. And um, so this creates uh, shadow effect. So when you, uh, you, you start to deposit and uh, um, at the first uh, stage you create some islands on the surface of the film, uh, but then because your incident flux uh, is uh, very low, then uh, you cannot deposit behind these islands. So, and then you, if you simultaneously rotate the substrate and keep uh, uh, the position in such a manner, you achieve the growth of uh, these islands. They start to grow vertically and eventually they form um, nanorods or pillars. So, and uh, we achieved, uh, you, you can see SEM image of the final structure. Uh, so we achieved, uh, we, we managed to grow uh, nanorods uh, with a length of uh, over two microns. And then uh, we can, we cover it, um, these tungsten oxide nanorods with bismuth vanadate by using electrochemical deposition. And then we also added uh, sopatalyst, which is uh, cobalt phosphate sopatalyst and we build this uh, kind of photon. And uh, um, we studied the properties of these tungsten oxide nanorods and uh, we took X-ray diffraction and we confirmed that we indeed have uh, both phases and they are with the right composition. Um, and uh, we optimize the structure by um, uh, changing the length of the nanorods and the thickness of uh, extremely thin absorber bismuth vanadate uh, layer. Uh, and uh, if uh, we found if we increase the length of the nanorod too much, then uh, the efficiency of uh, uh, this photonode, uh, we, we see decrease in uh, photocurrent. 
uh, because uh, uh, we have we start to have uh, resistive losses in long tungsten excite metal rods. And uh, also, if we increase the thickness of uh, bismuth vanadate layer too much, then we again uh, have uh, decreased in efficiency because uh, uh, we have increased recombination in thick bismuth vanadate layer. So there is some optimum uh, uh, ratio between the length of the tungsten oxide rods and the thickness of uh, bismuth vanadate layer. And um, uh, this is uh, photocurrent uh, versus uh, potential versus reverse hydrogen electrode. And uh, uh, what you have to understand is that uh, we achieved uh, 6.72 milliamps per uh, square centimeter photocurrent at uh, 1.23 uh, potential versus hydrogen electrode. And this corresponds to the uh, solar to hydrogen conversion efficiency of 8.3%, which was a world record uh, at uh, that time. So this work has been done in, uh, in the end of 2015. We also demonstrated, uh, we measured Faraday efficiency and uh, evolution of uh, hydrogen and oxygen by chromatography. And we confirmed that uh, our measurement of photocurrent of this photonode correspond to the real production of hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, and we also tested stability of this photon. Uh, to give you comparison uh, to other works, because th this uh, bismuth vanadate uh, material is a very popular uh, photocatalytic material for water splitting. And uh, there are different configuration, uh, like flat films, and also different combinations of uh, uh, different kinds of nanorods uh, uh, with uh, of tungsten oxide with bismuth vanadate. And uh, so these two lines basically show the progress of two systems based on a flat film of bismuth vanadate and on a non-structured uh, um, heterojunction. And our work uh, achieved almost 90, more than 90% of theoretically possible maximum for this material. Um, we published this paper in 2015 in uh, Nature Scientific Reports. And uh, yeah, again, this is a brief uh, explanation of the content of this paper. Um, we, uh, the main point of this paper is that uh, it is difficult to find one material which can satisfy, which can work as an efficient uh, photocatalyst for water splitting. But we can separate the different processes uh, of uh, photocatalytic water splitting and find uh, suitable materials which is optimal for each process. So we uh, decoupled uh, uh, different stages of photocatalytic water splitting and used uh, dedicated material for each one. So, and uh, we optimize this system so we can achieve uh, um, very good efficiency um, by using combination of materials. I have to give credit uh, for this work to uh, these people. So the main the experimental work has been done by Dr. Yuri Pihosh and uh, he, um, he worked and he is now working in the University of Tokyo and this is uh, his boss, uh, uh, Professor uh, Kitamori. Uh, from my side, um, in the AST, uh, I want to give credit to Dr. Matsui, Dr. Kondo, and Dr. Makita. Uh, so they helped to uh, fabricate uh, a solar cell, which we used to uh, combine with our uh, photonodes to make a uh, to achieve unassisted uh, water splitting. 
And also part of the optimization work has been done by uh, Sonia Kossar, who uh, she uh, was a PhD student in the University of Groningen, and now she's a PhD student in the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. Uh, I want to show this paper. It came out um, just, um, I think, a couple of weeks ago, uh, published by Dr. Pihosh, and he, he uh, uh, improved uh, the photocatalytic uh, um, properties of tantal nitrate nanorods. And uh, now I think uh, his result is uh, the best in the world in the photocatalytic water split. So if you have a chance to read this paper, please read. Um, now I want to finalize my talk. And uh, uh, this is, uh, there is no conclusion, but uh, take home messages. So the first one is uh, don't be pessimistic or optimistic about solar energy, be realistic. At present, solar energy accounts for 2.2% in total electricity generation and for only 0.4% in total energy use. Uh, the intermittent nature of solar energy requires adaptation of our energy systems and development of energy storage technologies. Uh, development of technologies for conversion of solar energy to fuel, uh, such as hydrogen, has some strategic advantages over others in terms of scalability, storage time, and flexibility of application of hydrogen fuel in uh, transportation, uh, residential sector, and in industry. This, of course, does not undermine advantages of other technologies in their uh, own niches. Uh, in the future, we will have a complex mix of energy generation technologies and energy storage technologies. This is for sure. Uh, at the first stage, hydrogen economy will grow from obtaining hydrogen from hydrocarbons. Uh, this does not make much sense right now regarding limiting uh, carbon dioxide emission unless so-called carbon dioxide sequestration technologies uh, which is geological storage of uh, CO2, uh, proved to be really working. However, it is important to create elements of hydrogen economy as soon as possible, for example, in transportation, uh, which is going to create demand for hydrogen, based on which we can progressively grow production of hydrogen from renewable sources, such as solar energy. Speaking of solar to hydrogen conversion, a uh, combination of photovoltaics with water electrolysis is the most uh, developed technology at present. However, photocatalytic water splitting potentially can have advantages in terms of cost, but much research efforts is required to develop efficient photocatalytic materials and nanostructures. Uh, thank you for your attention.